Gimbals are awesome. Many filmmakers choose them as their favorite stabilization tools, but they might not be the best choice in all situations. They come with a whole set of challenges you have to deal with, starting with the time and skill you need to rig, balance and calibrate your setup, or even the concerns over compatibility with rigging bigger cameras, such as the Pocket 6K Pro. Also, they need to rig them with accessories such as wireless follow focus, transmitters and side handles, all adding to the final price and all reasons to make you think twice before you pick up your gimbal. The reason why I was keen in finding a simpler, faster and cheaper solution that can offer me close enough results using nothing but a tool I already have. Everything you just watched was stabilized using nothing but a monopod, the unsung hero of stabilization gear. And to prove my point, I shot everything on very rough terrain to see how far I can get away with this technique. In this episode, I'll be showing you how monopods are the Swiss army tool of stabilization, not only because they can act as gimbals, but also as sliders, shoulder rigs, jibs, and even drones. I'll prove this to you through seven famous cinematic gimbal moves without the gimbal. Before we start, let's set some ground rules. You have three factors that control your smooth gimbal-like movements with your monopod. First, your choice of gear. Second, your technique. And finally, a minimal amount of post, which is optional if you didn't perfect the first two. Let's start with the gear. Obviously, you need a monopod and a fluid head combo. Technically, you can use any brand or model you're comfortable with or already own. But personally, I'll be using the iFootage Monopod Cobra 2, which became my monopod of choice recently. Apart from having a high quality build, it also has this great feature of a simple twist lock mechanism that lets you extend the monopod all the way in one simple motion. This feature will come handy in one of the moves I'll share with you shortly. I also used iFootage K5 Fluid Head, which I found to be such a great choice for a small size setup. I ended up buying three of them for all my mirrorless cameras. Again, you can use any other head you're comfortable with or already own. Now there's another important accessory you would need, and that's a small tilt head adapter. I used the Manfrotto 234 Monopod 90 degrees tilt head. This basically allows you to tilt the fluid head by 90 degrees in both directions. You'll see why we need it in a second. Keep in mind that this is a pretty uncommon piece of accessory that might be hard to find, so I'll leave links to all this along with alternatives in the description below. Full disclosure, iFootage only sent me the monopod to use in any content of my choice, and I found its quality and features to perfectly fit the topic of this episode. They didn't pay me or ask me to say any of this, and they have no idea about the content of this episode. So everything I'm sharing here with you is, as always, purely my personal honest and unbiased opinion. Finally, when it comes to the camera setup, I used the Sony e7S III with a 24-70 Sigma art lens. The main reason why you would pick this camera is because it saves gyro metadata to the files, which can later be used by Sony's App Catalyst Browse to electronically stabilize your footage if needed. This is a unique and very powerful feature found in most video-centric Sony cameras, and it can offer very smooth stabilization results, even better and more accurate than the in-body image stabilizer. You'll find tons of videos on how it works on YouTube, but since not everyone owns Sony cameras, I will use the standard in-body image stabilization which offers similar results to all IBIS-enabled cameras out there. Also, the reason why I use this lens, it has built-in optical stabilization, and when paired with an IBIS-enabled camera, you get smoother footage than with IBIS alone. Bottom line, it's ideal to find a camera that can offer any kind of stabilization, whether electronic or sensor shift, and pair it with a lens with a compatible optical stabilization. This way, you'll eliminate all those micro jitters, and you'll be ready for the next level of stabilization, which fully depends on your technique. Last but not least, I used an external monitor, which will come handy in a couple of moves I'll be showing you shortly. I personally used the Atomos Ninja 5, it's small, relatively light, and bright enough for outdoors, but you can use whichever monitor you're happy with as long as it's not too heavy. It's a good time to talk about technique while watching the first basic gimbal move, the follow. Probably the most common camera movement, it's used to, obviously, follow your subject and their actions. Like here for example where I establish the relationship between our awesome model Magdalena and the environment that's surrounding her. As you can see, the follow move can have many angles, frames and even directions. Let's start with a forward follow. In this one, you're simply following your subject from behind and walking at the same speed and forward direction. Ideally, pick a medium wide shot with the lens set between 24 and 35mm. 
capture it in a bit of a low angle to establish that relationship between her, the path she's following, and the environment she's surrounded by. Since you can't really see her face, this shot can become an establishing shot that focuses more on the environment before revealing your subject, basically adding a bit of a suspense to the scene. Now on how this was shot. First, tilt your monopod head to almost 90 degrees using the tilt adapter I told you about earlier. Tighten it in position. Your right hand will hold the fluid head's arm as first point of contact that will also control the tilt and pan movements and secure the monopod along and under your left forearm as a second point or area of contact. Now you can adjust its position and have freedom of movement while keeping it pretty stable in all angles. With that setup, I steadily followed her from the back, keeping a bit of a gap between my body and the monopod to let my left shoulder dampen any shakiness in my body as I walk on such rough grounds. Another framing is the over the shoulder. Here's a medium close frame and a medium frame. The technique is very similar. You tilt the monopod by 90 degrees, but this time you put it over your shoulder as a first point of contact, just like a shoulder rig. Now your left hand is free for manual zooming or focusing if needed and acts as a second point of contact. Your right hand again will handle the fluid head's arm as a third point of contact and for panning and tilting movement of course. Unlike a shoulder rig, this setup allows you a subtle dolly in and out by sliding the rig over your shoulder. You can also jip up and down for slightly higher or lower angles. And if your setup is light enough, then you won't really need any counterweight behind your shoulder. Now all you need to do is to follow your talent and be as steady as you can. What I actually like about this technique over gimbals is how you get this organic handheld yet very smooth movements. It gives the shot a bit of life, rather than the super stabilized gimbal shots that feel a little bit more synthetic to me. Now using those techniques, you can do the reverse follow, which is the same in everything, but you'll just be moving backwards while facing the talent. This kind of shot is perfect to reveal your talent or subject right after the previous establishing shots I showed you. Also a great tip, when I shot at a lower and wider angle, notice how I was speeding up away from her to reveal more of the background. It's good when you want her to feel more immersed in that environment. Here's another version of the follow move, the arc follow. It's a rather more dynamic version where instead of moving forward or backwards in a straight line, you'll move diagonally while keeping the camera fixed on the subject, which will give you this arc-like move. The beauty of this version is the exaggerated parallax effect between your talent and the background which works perfect if you need to reveal more of the environment around her in a more dynamic way. It's ideally used between medium and wide shots. Before moving on to the next moves, I want to mention the third factor of getting stabilized shots, which is post-stabilization. And remember, this is optional. It all depends on your performance and how shaky your hands were, or even how much coffee you had in the morning. Let me show you how this footage looked right out of the camera. You can still see how there's still some handheld feeling to it and it can get bumpy at some point because of the rough terrain. So that's when you can add post-stabilization to dial it down to your liking. And here's how they look side by side. I personally like to take away the bumpiness, but still keep that smooth handheld feel for that organic look I mentioned before. I honestly use the built-in Final Cut stabilization feature, nothing fancy. If you're using Premiere Pro, its built-in warp stabilizer is a much more powerful tool, so you'll probably get much better results. Again, if you shoot on Sony cameras, then I would surely advise taking advantage of their post gyro stabilization I told you about. Now on to the next move, the side track, which is following the subject from the side, basically framing their profile. To get the best results, you'll need to walk right next to the talent while still facing forward, and only let the camera face your talent using the same technique of the underarm grip I told you about. Here's a cool trick. I use the trees in the foreground to create this occlusion wipe transition between two clips, Basically, the tree wipes the first clip and rolls in the second one. But did you notice what just happened? This is actually the same clip that I just looped. Pretty cool trick to use in social media if you want to have a clip that loops while looking like a long clip that never ends. Moving on to a super simple move, the cream or jib. This move took advantage of the single twist lock feature on this monopod. All you need to do is twist the handle to unlock it, and with a controlled motion, let gravity do its thing and jib the camera down. Same thing happened in this shot. When you look at the behind the scenes, just make sure to have a steady grip over the camera and maybe slow down your movement near the end to a full stop. These kind of shots are perfect when you need a smooth transition of our attention between two subjects or actions. 
in this case between the talent and the book she's reading, where I give her a cue to turn the page as the book entered the frame. Now onto more advanced moves, the drone move. Here I'll be following the talent, but this time from a high angle, a bird's eye view basically, or in these modern times, I guess we can call it a drone's eye view. Just like in the first follow move, this kind of frame highlights the relationship between the talent and her environment, but with a lot more emphasis on that environment. This helps for example when narratively you're trying to establish the vastness of the space around her and how small she is in comparison. So how I did that, I extended the monopod to its maximum height, locked it with that twisty handle, then lifted it up to a safe height I can handle. I placed one hand comfortably somewhere mid-length, then slowly and steadily started moving forward. This is the first time the external monitor becomes crucial for framing, since the camera screen would be too small to use at that distance. The keys to have a steady shot in such weird position is, first, keeping the monopod slightly away from your sides to let both arms absorb any shaking from your body, which needs to be kept steady as well, especially on such rough terrain. And the best way to do that is walking in the famous DP Ninja Walk, aka the heel to toe. In case you don't know, the way it works is let your foot slowly land on the ground heel first, then let it roll from the heel to toe as you step forward, all while keeping your knees softly bent at all times, basically acting like a shock absorber to dampen your foot's impact with the ground. Of course, if you're walking backwards for reverse move, then needless to say, it's a toe to heel. This should be your technique in all moves by the way, not just for this one. This one took me two takes to get it right honestly, but remember, I'm walking on very uneven grounds. So maybe on solid smooth ground, I would have got it from the first take. Here's an idea to turn this into a great opening shot. Start with a wide clean frame of only the location, then let your talent slowly walk into frame, as you can see here in the bottom. This kind of shots can be the perfect first establishing shot of your short frame for example, if the location of your protagonist is key to the narrative. This may even be a closing shot where the protagonist fades into the distance. Also a great practice is to use the wide lens, like the 24mm I used here. It's not just to get the wide field of view, but also as you know, wide lenses stretch distances and give you the illusion that things are much further or higher than they really are. So it will give you the feeling that the camera is way up at a very high angle, while it's only 4 feet above her head level as you can see. Now let's move from a super high angle to a super low angle for the crawl move. This is another great opening shot idea. Being that close to the ground, the movement makes this shot a lot more dynamic and very intriguing. And the framing offers a very unconventional perspective of the world you're introducing to your viewers. As you saw, we can follow the talent or reverse follow from the front. So in this reverse direction, what I did was just flip the whole setup upside down. Right hand holding the monopod for your first point of contact, left hand is your second point of contact on the fluid head handle, and controlling the pan and tilt. And once again, I advise using a monitor since the camera's monitor is now pretty far down. Just rig it to the monopod using a monitor clamp. I'll put a link in the description. Now for the forward crawl, following the drone opening shot idea, you can tease with framing the ground first, as you slowly tilt up to reveal your talent's feet stepping forward. The rest was again the same, just a steady heel to toe walk, and maintain your height from the ground if you want to keep it simple. I must say, this move could be a bit tricky to properly coordinate your actions and keep everything steady, but nothing's too hard with a bit of practice. I felt a bit rusty when I shot this, and it took me 3 to 4 takes to get it to this one. Ok, staying at the same low angle, our next move is the slider. Again, just like the crawl move, this could be a very nice opening shot that focuses more on the close-up details of the foreground while teasing about the protagonist by keeping her in the background and out of focus. Now the technique is also very similar to the crawl. Your right hand gripping on the monopod as your first point of contact, your left hand on the handle, but now your forearm resting on your leg for a much steadier control. And finally, your third point of contact is resting your monopod's foot on your shoulder. Now all you need to do is just sway right and left to get the slider movement range and speed you like. This also doubles as a pretty good side lunges workout. So the key here is to rig the monopod as tight as possible to your body, so you and the monopod become one, like how you rig a camera to a car. This way, to move the monopod is to move your body. It might look hard, but it's much easier than you think. Now the next move is what's called the hero moment, aka vertical pivot. This move can be used in key emotional moments in your film, maybe to highlight an object of discovery that triggered a turning point in your hero's journey, or a Michael Bay type of hero reveal moment, showing the strength of your hero whether in good or evil context. 
This move is the monopod version of the vertical pivot move that first featured in the Film Poets channel, then again in Parker Waldeck's channel, where they said, now this one was probably the hardest shot to pull off and took about 10 tries and still we didn't get it exactly how we want, but you get the idea, it's just gonna take some practice. I can see why it's hard. There's a lot to process if you're using a gimbal. If we break it down, this move is a combination of jib down, dolly in and tilt up all happening simultaneously, giving you this nice dolly in arc movement. But the good news is that it's actually much easier and simpler if you're using a monopod. Let me show you how. So first, to set my starting frame, I pinned the monopod on the ground and went a bit further back to increase the distance between her and the camera. I adjusted the best height to compose this frame, where the camera was at shoulder height, showing the darker background of the woods behind her, effectively making it a low-key shot. I asked her to look down onto the side to give an impression of vulnerability, for narrative reasons. Now, while still keeping the monopod base in place, I used it as a pivot point to dolly in with the camera, creating this arc we were talking about earlier. So as the camera was moving forward, I was tilting up to frame her all the way to the end till I reached a lower angle frame almost at chest level. Now the final frame has the sun flaring in the background in an empowering high key shot reflecting a turning point where she rose from the dark to the light. Also now she's looking straight in a much more confident way. Also a good tip, notice how I slowed down as I was going into my final position just to add some suspense to the shot. As for this shot with the book, I followed the same technique, only this time I started with the camera tilted further down to frame the book, then the final frame was tilted further up on the talent. It's worth noting if you compare this monopod version and the gimbal version of this move, the main difference is the dolly in travel distance from the initial point to the talent. The monopod version here is limited by the arc distance the monopod can travel, which is not that far, but works perfectly as you saw while the gimbal version gives you the flexibility to travel as far as you want with your first frame, but the move becomes exponentially harder the further you go. Now we checked all those moves, let's put them together in a quick montage to show you the results of monopod stabilization. I hope this showed you the true potential of monopods and why I see them as one of the most versatile filmmaking tools. Again, I'm not trying to say that monopods will replace gimbals anytime soon. All I'm saying is, with a much simpler setup, steady hands and some imagination, a simple tool such as a monopod can offer you very stabilized moves close enough to many other more advanced and expensive tools out there that would probably take you 10 times the amount of time to achieve similar or slightly better result. In the end, it's all about how complex the move is and finding the best tool for the job. Not everything needs a gimbal. Let me know which move you like the most in the comments below. If you're interested, I will soon be uploading all footage you saw to Artgrid, in case you want to download them and use them in any of your projects. You can use the link below to get two months free on your subscription. Hope you liked this episode. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you next time.